Uh, good morning. Let me, uh, let me welcome everyone to the bicentennial celebration and welcome you all to our panel on special counsels and uh, special prosecutors and independent counsels on investigating senior government officials. I'm David Strauss, I'm class of 1978. Um, I'm on the faculty at the University of Chicago Law School, uh, but I'm a visiting professor here this fall. We have a, a, a truly impressive panel. I'll introduce them in a second. I should say Susan Davies, who was uh, supposed to join us, got called away on another bicentennial matter, so she's unable to join us. But this is a, a remarkable range and depth of experience that's represented on our panel. Our subject, which is investigations of senior government officials, including the President of the United States, I mean, this, the investigations of this, sign, time, of this kind seem to be a, uh, a recurring feature of American political life going back at least a generation um, or more. And, you know, in some ways that's obviously not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing that senior government officials, sometimes including the President, are engaged in actions that give rise to a legitimate concern that they may have committed, uh, abused their power or even committed a crime. That's not a good thing. On the other side, it's also not a good thing if these investigations are not being used for legitimate reasons, but as another means of partisan political warfare. Um, but having said that, it's a very good thing that we live in a, in a country where institutions exist so that if these allegations are raised, there are institutions and people who are able to investigate them and decide whether, in fact, senior government officials or even the president have done something grossly improper or criminal. That's a critical part of the rule of law, that institutions like that exist. And to say institutions like that uh, exist, well, the institutions have to be staffed by people. There have to be people who conduct these investigations in a way that's uh, thorough and fair and, that, and according to the highest standards of our profession. And that, that brings me to our, um, our, as I said, truly impressive panel. I, I tried to arrange the speakers roughly in chronological order of the investigations that they've been involved in, but there's a problem with that, which is so many of them have been involved in so many things over so many years that that turned out to be a, a very, um, let's say, imperfect criterion. Um, but nonetheless, here's the, uh, Here's the order in which they'll be speaking. Immediately um, to my left is Phil Hyman. Phil is the James Barr Ames Professor Emeritus uh, here. He held senior positions in both the Justice Department and the State Department. In the Justice Department, he was an Assistant Solicitor General. He was a Deputy Attorney General. He was uh, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division. In the State Department, he was the Acting Administrator of the Bureau of, Secur of Security and Consular Affairs. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of International Organizations, and he was Executive Assistant to the Undersecretary. Um, he's, of course, written many articles and books, including four books on combating terrorism. Most immediately, for our purposes, he was involved in independent counsel investigations, uh, including Watergate, where he was one of Archibald Cox's first two appointments to his Watergate team. Um, to the, also the Phil was also involved in the investigation of Bert Lance, which is in the Carter administration, and the Whitewater matter in the uh, Clinton administration. To Phil's left is George Frampton, Jr. Uh, George is the co-founder of the Partnership for Responsible Growth, Growth which he co-founded in 2014. That is a nonprofit advocacy group that's dedicated to building a bipartisan consensus for a revenue-neutral carbon tax. Uh, before George graduated from here in 1969, he uh, graduated from Yale College and from LSE. He was a law clerk to Justice Blackman. Um, he served as the president of the Wilderness Society, as an assistant secretary of the Interior for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. He was chairman of the Council on, on Environmental Quality in the White House from 98 to 2001. He was a, a partner at Boy Schiller from 2001 to 2009, and then senior counsel, senior of counsel at Covington from 2009 to 2014. Uh, bearing on, uh, on our panel this morning, uh, 
Uh, George was an assistant special prosecutor for in the Watergate special prosecution team. He worked on grand jury, the grand jury investigation. He also worked on the trial of some of President Nixon's aides. He was an assistant independent counsel in the investigation of Edwin Meese before Meese's confirmation as attorney general. And he was special counsel to the attorney general of Alaska in an investigation of the governor, Bill Sheffield. Also, while he was a partner at Rogovin, Hugie, and Lenzner, um, he was deputy director and chief of staff of the NRC's, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's, investigation into the Three Mile Island disaster. To George's left is uh, Robert Luskin. Bob has been involved in nearly every significant public corruption case in Washington, D.C. since his first day at the Justice Department in 1981, when he says Phil Hyman assigned them to help with managing the Abscam investigation. Uh, during what Bob uh, characterizes the bull market years of the 90s, um, <laughs> he represented Interior Secretary Babbitt, the White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Phil Hyman himself, and an Assistant Attorney General, and others in a variety of independent counsel investigations into uh, uh, Secretary Babbitt, um, Secretary Mike Espy, and uh, the Whitewater Independent Counsel investigation. And Bob later represented Carl Rove in the special counsel investigation of the leak of Valerie Flame's identity and in a separate investigation of U.S. attorney firings. <coughs> Bob has been an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown also for a number of years. To Bob's left is uh, Patrick Fitzgerald. Pat is a partner at Skadden Arps. Before he joined Skadden in 2014, Pat was the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. He was appointed in 2001 to that job, which he held until 2012. He was appointed by President George W. Bush, and Pat was the longest U.S. serving U.S. attorney ever in Chicago. Um, in that capacity, as a U.S. attorney in my uh, hometown, uh, he led uh, numerous high-profile investigations and prosecutions because there's some pretty, um, uh, uh, pretty good opportunities there. Uh, uh, and among other things, he secured investigation. He secured convictions on corruption charges of uh, two uh, successive governors of Illinois, George Ryan and Rod Blagojevich. He also can, uh, secured the conviction of Conrad Black, a major media figure in, the, in Chicago. As special counsel, uh, Pat was the leader of the investigation into the leaks of Valerie Plame's identity, and he tried the case of the United States against Louis Libby. Also, while he was U.S. attorney, his office prosecuted several significant fraud, civil rights, organized crime, narcotics, and national security cases, and Pat was involved in several nationwide initiatives, including the President's Corporate Fraud Tax Force and the Attorney General's Advisory Committee. Mike Bromwich, who is next to Pat, is the managing principal of the Bromwich Group. He's senior counsel to the Robbins Russell Law Firm in Washington, D.C. He's been practicing for 37 years, both as a prosecutor's experience, both as a prosecutor and a defense lawyer. He was an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District, uh, Southern District of New York from 1983 to 87. Then he was an associate counsel in the independent counsel's office that investigated the Iran-Contra affair. In that office, he was the overall coordinator of the grand jury piece of the investigation and he headed a team that investigated a number of government officials and private citizens in connection with the provision of aid to Contras in Nicaragua. Uh, Mike was also one of the three trial lawyers for the United States in the Oliver North case. Then after that, uh, Mike served as Inspector General for the Department of Justice, and most recently he's been an independent monitor for Apple and Walmart, and also the Washington, D.C. and Virgin Islands Police Departments and he's been a consultant to a number of law enforcement agencies concerned with implementing um, use of force reforms and accountability reforms. Then Bill Kelly um, is a professor at Notre Dame, Notre Dame Law School, William Kelly. He worked as a consultant to independent counsel Kenneth Starr during the Lewinsky phase of the Whitewater investigation. And in addition to that, he was deputy White House counsel, deputy counsel to the president from 2005 to 2007. And in that capacity, from that side, he was involved in various investigations, including an investigation into the Valerie Plain matter. So that is our, our, our panel, which, as I said to you, is really, really remarkable. Um, just to start things off, I have a question uh, for them. 
to frame our discussion, which is, which is this. Uh, based on what you saw in the matters you were involved with, would you say that the institutions we have are well designed to investigate high-ranking government officials um, or not? And, and if not, how should they be changed? What should we do differently? So we'll begin with Phil. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we've, our institutions have been redesigned a number of times. I looked it up last night. <clears throat> Actually, the first special prosecutor was one appointed by Grant and then fired by Grant after the Civil War. Uh, so they, and, and they come along steadily about every generation after that. Uh, I'm sorry. Go. Okay, the, the first uh, real special prosecutor was appointed by Ulysses S. Grant, and we've had him about every generation since then. I know when Archie Cox was appointed, uh, he, he could only uh, remember back to Teapot Dome. There was a Teapot Dome <laughs> appointment by Coolidge, I guess. Okay. Right now, in the last 20 years, we've had about three relatively minor variations. In the time of Watergate, uh, the appointment was by the Attorney General with a odd hoke. Uh, uh, list of powers and requirements. It was, uh, the appointment was made as the price of getting, uh, of confirming Richard Nixon's choice of Elliot Richardson as Attorney General. The Senate Judiciary Committee said only if he appoints a special counsel and Archie Cox, who I've worked with all his life, almost all his life, was uh, about the sixth or seventh choice, and he turned out to be wonderful. Okay. Um, <laughs> then we had an independent council, which was a statute, the most notable part of which I think is that it was triggered automatically for the Attorney General whenever there was, whenever he couldn't quickly disprove that the uh, subject of it, it it had a list of named subjects, president, vice president, cabinet members, things like that. Whenever he couldn't disprove a charge, he had to uh, appoint an independent counsel to investigate it and either bring charges or dismiss the case. But the critical thing about it was it was triggered with a very slight level of uh, proof. Uh, nothing much more than suspicion. And now we're working under Attorney General guidelines. Uh, Mueller is working under Attorney General guidelines. And uh, the Attorney General has more, uh, he has more discretion either to uh, appoint or not to appoint. And uh, he has somewhat more power to fire. That's also an important part. But now, let me just now, list what seem to me the important stages and what, how we're doing on each of them. Uh, I've mentioned just now, uh, the first one is what's the, on what occasions should an independent counsel or a special, I'll call them from now on special prosecutor, from, from, on what occasions should a special prosecutor be appointed? It's a difficult one. Uh, I don't, David talked about whenever uh, the president had committed a crime, I'm not convinced that there should be a special prosecutor for trivial crimes. Uh, with all due respect to everybody on uh, the panel here, I would uh, worry about, I, I don't think that lying in a uh, interview, in a uh, on oath interview, about whether you've had, whether the president has had an affair with any other women uh, is really a serious enough matter to disrupt the country. We might have to worry about what should be done on that. That's more or less the Bill Clinton one. Uh, and there's, uh, during the Clinton period, there was a, these are just illustrative, uh, special prosecutor appointed for the secretary of HUD who had been interviewed 
by the FBI and uh, who had information that he had a mistress, too, uh, too, much, too much sex here, that he had a mistress <laughs> and he had reported to the uh, people who were, this was I think when he was getting appointed, Secretary of HUD, he had uh, reported that he had paid her $25,000 and it really turned out to be $100,000 and he spent the rest of his time dealing with a special prosecutor. It didn't make any difference if it was 25 or 50 or 100,000. Anyway, the first big question is when should we have uh, special prosecutors? I don't think every crime. I think it has to be one that really would raise questions about rule of law if the president was not, I'll make it the president, it, could be any of a number of people, was not prosecuted. It has to be serious in that way. Um, Cis Cisneros was the secretary of HUD who was involved with the $100,000. Um, we need an appointment when the matter is serious enough to put in question the applicability of the law to high officials. But uh, if it's a president, he won't be prosecuted in all likelihood, even if he's found guilty, because people don't want to interfere with the presidential term. Uh, and so there's not too much point in uh, appointing a special prosecutor for the most trivial of offenses. On the other hand, it's a bad mistake not to appoint, a, a bad mistake that other countries have made much more than us, not to appoint a special prosecutor for a leader who is making serious, uh, mis who is acting in seriously dangerous ways to democracy and the rule of law. That happens all over the world, all, all the time, and we need special prosecutors or something like that then. And we're quite capable of doing that well. The second big question, is how do you choose the prosecutor? Uh, the, we've had two ways of doing it. I think just two, uh, no, more than two. In the old days, they used to appoint a Republican and a Democrat. This is the really old days, close to 100 years ago. Uh, nowadays, uh, under the independent counsel law, which was triggered so quickly, Three judges appointed by the Chief Justice, I suppose, would decide whether there should be a special prosecutor and who it should be. And more recently, it's been left to the discretion of the Attorney General. Uh, it makes a difference because what we're trying to buy with a special prosecutor is credibility. What we want is a credible investigation and a credible accounting of what a high official has done. And we don't trust the normal system to do that. But that means we have to choose very carefully. I, don't, I think we've chosen well uh, most of the time. But a lot turns on that. Who's the appointed prosecutor? A lot also turns on how his uh, staff is chosen. One of the things that Archie Cox probably didn't do well, although I think almost everybody who was there thinks he was spectacular, was he had an almost all Democratic staff with one very distinguished Republican, uh, Phil Lacavera, as his, in a very senior position. But it was almost all Democratic. If it would be possible to get a credibly nonpartisan uh, staff too, I wouldn't insist on it being 50-50, but at least enough of a bipartisanship, that too is part of the choice of prosecutors. The third big question is the choice of process. Does he have to do things the same way the Justice Department does them? I think there's something to be said for that. That's what the rule is now, that, the, uh, that Bob Mueller has to use the same processes that uh, the Justice Department would use. That's the way the new system works. I think it makes some sense. We're only interested in 
<coughs> preventing important people from getting away because they're important people with crimes that are dangerous to the rule of law. And if the only reason they get away is because the same process is used in prosecuting them as in prosecuting anyone else, so be it. I'm not at all, I, I think it's a good idea to insist on the same process. That means about plea bargains, about grand jury, about all the things that are part of prosecution. Uh, the fourth question is the one uh, that I mentioned very early, the security that the prosecutor gets from being fired. In the newest system, the one that Mueller's working under, he gets much less protection from being fired than uh, the independent counsel system from uh, 1973 to 81 gave. Um, and I think it's very important. You have to be able to fire him if he does something egregious, but not otherwise. When at the end of, Water, of the Watergate investigation, uh, Richard Nixon had a proposed substitute for turning over the tapes. It was a rare case where uh, whoever got the tapes would win the litigation. It was just going to be that way. Nixon said a cover-up was done by his chief counsel, John Dean. John Dean said the cover-up was arranged by Nixon. Then in about three months into the investigation, an uh, aide of Nixon's called Butterfield announced that whether he wondered whether anybody on the Senate committee was interested in the fact that all the conversations, including about, uh, about whether uh, who, who would run the cover-up, had been recorded. And of course, the whole world changed then. All of a sudden, instead of, all of a sudden, uh, the Cox team didn't know what the tape said, but they knew they had to find out what the tape said. And uh, Nixon knew what the tape said, and he knew he had to hide what the tape said. And it became a totally different game. In the end, he went to, he had to get the permission of the Attorney General to fire Cox at the very end, at the time of the Saturday Night Massacre. The Attorney General had uh, promised personally, Elliot Richardson had promised personally that he would not fire Cox except for extremely uh, severe uh, bad actions. And he really couldn't fire Cox once that had happened. This, this is the importance of on what terms you can fire the special prosecutor. Because the president and the senior people will have a lot of leverage. They will be able to do a lot of things. But when they promised personally in the first Watergate, it was almost impossible for them to then agree to fire Cox. And finally, the question, the last question we should be discussing is the, uh, what is the consequence of an investigation. The consequence of the investigation of a prosecutor, if you think he can't be prosecuted personally, is to prosecute his aides who did it with him. Uh, that's not a bad consequence, but uh, it's, I, I, we, we haven't quite determined that you can't prosecute a, seat, a sitting president, you have to impeach him, but if that's the rule, uh, the consequence becomes quite different. I think I'm going to quit there, David. <laughs> Thank you. George Franklin. Thank you. Shall I, shall I use this? Can people hear? David, thank you for organizing this. And uh, my fellow panelists, I'm not sure we're going to be as interesting as the six panelists who were talking yesterday afternoon. That was quite a fabulous advertisement for Harvard Law School. But we'll try. I think if the question is, does the uh, existing legal framework we're operating under, let's say, in the Mueller investigation, uh, provide a good basis for an investigation that's going to be thorough and fair, 
The answer, by and large, is yes, but I say that with two caveats. Yes, in the sense that even though this is a structure that's evolved from Watergate days when it was kind of a, a invented ad hoc regulatory within the Justice Department to a statutory system and back now to a ad hoc-ism, uh, and has changed in some, some minor respects. Nonetheless, the structure, it seems to me, provides reasonably optimal to provide support for an investigation of either the president or important administrative, uh, administration officials where their attorney general or the Justice Department has a conflict. Two caveats, one is it's just hard to imagine how you would really write rules to guarantee that the person selected to run a special investigation has the, the character, the probity, the experience, and the values to do it right. And in fact, you know, I think we've been extraordinarily lucky uh, to have those kinds of people uh, virtually in every case in the last 35 years. Um, uh, and I, you know, uh, put that down partly. I associate having people who are experienced prosecutors with values because I learned right away as a kid going to work on the Watergate prosecution that, you know, the really good prosecutors, experienced prosecutors, live not only with respect but even fear of the absolutely almost uncheckable, unaccountable power that a federal prosecutor with an impaneled grand jury and subpoena power has. There's almost no limit on that power. And the people who are good at this have an enormous amount of respect for that. And they're not afraid of being accused of being a little too aggressive in the end, but they are very afraid of overreaching that power. And those are the kinds of people you need to have running these investigations. In the Watergate, Archie was not an experienced prosecutor, but he had a number of consigliere, including uh, Phil and, uh, and, and Jim Vorenberg, who were uh, experts in the criminal justice system, and people like James Neal, who had been a prosecutor, prosecuted Jimmy Hoffa, but also a famous defense lawyer, who, who had enormous respect for the power that prosecutors wield. And of course, we see that today, that's a big issue in criminal justice reform. Uh, I faced this <clears throat> actually a little bit in a reverse way myself because in 1985 I was appointed by the Attorney General of Alaska to conduct an gr independent grand jury investigation of the governor's chief of staff. <clears throat> and I went, up to, I went up to Juneau and eventually I did an investigation. I immunized the governor's chief of staff. I told him we weren't going to indict him, but we were going to immunize him and I ended up with what was an indictable, prima facie, two-witness perjury case against the governor. <clears throat> but it was a perjury case in which the governor had lied in a grand jury, sworn grand jury testimony about something that was said in a meeting or not said with a labor leader whose union ended up getting a government building lease. There was absolutely no criminal implication or conduct underlying any of this. The governor could have told the truth or not told the truth. It didn't make any difference to anything. And so I made a decision that, to recommend to the grand jury that even though it had an indictable case, that it issue a report instead of indicting the governor. Uh, and I think it's what probably, if you'll excuse the expression, um, experienced prosecutors would call a chicken shit perjury case. And I didn't want to bring that case against a sitting governor. Uh, the deputy attorney general, who's the chief prosecutor of the state, who was supervising my investigation, hated the governor and wanted to indict him. And technically, it was my decision about what to recommend to the grand jury, but I allowed him to come to the grand jury and recommend indictment and have a debate with me. I didn't guarantee that if the grand jury voted that way that I would authorize it. But in fact, the grand jury unanimously decided to issue a report. So this would have been a little bit like in the Watergate days if Leon Jaworski had invited somebody like me to go to the grand jury and make a recommendation to indict the president, right? It worked out, but I found myself very much on the flip side of being in a situation where I was accused afterwards because the governor, it was an impeachment attempt which failed. The governor didn't get reelected. I ended up going up there a few years later as an interior, the senior interior department of Democrat, 
going to Alaska, who had a lot of sway over all the public lands, and Bill Sheffield, the person I hadn't indicted, was the head of the Democratic Party, so we had to go around and do dinners together, an interesting <laughs> aftermath. <clears throat> the second caveat, so the caveat, one is, how do you write rules about who to, to pick the right people, because the people are so terribly, <clears throat> terribly important, and you can say, well, let's try something creative like the independent counsel law. Let's have three judges choose the independent counsel, right? <clears throat> but one could argue that one situation, one appointment which did not work out very well and was regarded by many people as an abuse of the independent counsel law was one that came from an appointment by three judges. So without making any judgment about that, uh, you know, those kinds of rules don't ultimately uh, guarantee that you're going to get the right kind of person. The second, uh, you know, I would say the second uh, caveat is that uh, it is hard to imagine in our constitutional system how we could or that it would be a good idea to try to write rules that would really prevent the president ultimately from ending the investigation. So if the president can find enough attorneys general to fire the special prosecutor and do, stop the investigation, our system still allows that. So the same fear that uh, drove me in September of 1973 <clears throat> to take what was then the sort of proto-prosecution memorandum on Richard Nixon, which was all the evidence we had compiled about criminal conduct by the president, didn't amount to much of an indictable case, uh, to take that and, and hide it in my grandmother's dirt basement in Arlington, Virginia, a couple weeks before the Saturday Night Massacre, those fears are still there today. But we, we can't count on legal rules, I don't think, to guard against that possibility. We have to you know, uh, <coughs> count on how our democracy works. One final thought about the current investigation. What's interesting about it is that <coughs> what concerns me about Mueller's investigation is that our current situation is a little bit more like the work I did to run an independent investigation of the Three Mile Island accident for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because there, there was a systemic threat. It wasn't about finding people to blame. There was a systemic threat <clears throat> that the nuclear industry was not quite safe enough. And it was partly due to the regulators and the industry and the public and the legislators. And uh, so the, the, it was a systemic problem. Right now, <clears throat> the biggest systemic problem we face, I think, is finding out what it is that the Russians did, how they did it, and how we can try to guard against they're doing it again, or somebody with a similar resources and intent trying to do it the next time. A special prosecutor investigation looking at criminal conduct, you know, is not the ideal way to bring that to public attention. That's not what Mueller's supposed to be doing. Uh, of course, I, if there were people in the administration or the campaign who fooled around with the Russians, who helped them, and their criminal violations, we want to make sure that there's a truly thorough attempt to find that out and bring charges if possible. But the biggest systemic threat is probably not uh, a few uh, uh, Trump hangers on fooling around with the Russians. It's the bigger problem. That's the kind of problem that needs to be the subject of an independent investigation by a presidential commission or a joint bipartisan congressional commission, and there's history for those kinds of investigations, uh, but uh, we're, not, we, we're not seeing that. All of the wonderful resources in the Mueller investigation, the people who should be investigating and writing a report on what the Russians did in concert with the intelligence community, that's only going to produce either indictments or no indictments. And I'm not very confident that the Senate Intelligence Committee, as much as its leaders are seem to be doing a wonderful job, has either the, the staff or the momentum uh, to do the kind of job the country needs. So in a way, to me, the Mueller investigation is, it's not investigating a sideline here, but it's investigating the component of this that is perhaps less important to the public in the large as we go forward. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Uh, you know, to some extent, I think that we have in the independent counsels and special prosecutors uh, an institution that is somewhat at war with its purposes. I mean, as Phil has said, 
there, there are really two purposes to these appointments. One is actual substantive fairness, uh, which I would call treating likes alike, so that, you know, Dick Cheney gets the same justice as Joe Sixpack. Uh, and the other really is, has to do with legitimacy, which is conveying to the public at large uh, that uh, that's actually what's going on. And those two goals are not necessarily uh, reconcilable. Um, you know, it, talking about the, the first, which is just substantive fairness, um, I, I'm obviously speaking from personal and anecdotal experience, but, but the sample size is pretty large and includes a couple dozen congressmen and White House aides, and, and this is probably a topic for another discussion, a surprising number of sitting federal judges. Um, and in my consistent experience, both in and out of the Department of Justice, uh, I have never seen a situation where a uh, prosecution uh, has been manipulated for partisan political purposes. Simply never seen it. And what is more, uh, I think the, the perception and the uh, stated need for the appointment of someone independent is a mistrust of the institution of the Department of Justice and a feeling that because it is led by a political appointees appointed by the president, um, that as an institution, uh, it can't be trusted also to be credible. And uh, the difficulty with that is that you end up appointing individuals, some of whom are wonderful, some of whom are not so wonderful, um, but who are in, basically idiosyncratic uh, in their approaches uh, to uh, investigation and prosecution and who sit outside the hierarchy and norms and experience of the Department of Justice. Uh, in dealing with individual cases, not independent counsel cases, I've certainly had plenty of experiences where I thought the prosecutors were uh, bloody-minded or venal um, or completely misguided, um, but, but never partisan. Uh, but in each of those instances where I thought someone had gone completely off the rails, uh, there was an institutional structure uh, above them at Maine Justice uh, that was designed to try to ensure uh, that the same rules and practices and norms were applied consistently. Uh, and that uh, means that the Department of Justice really is part of the solution in most cases, not part of the problem. Uh, and if you take them out of the equation, uh, you end up with a process that is essentially unmoored. Uh, and, and I think, you know, Pat is the exception that proves the rule. I mean, we were joined at the hip for three and a half years uh, in the Valerie Plain investigation. Uh, but, but the saving grace from my perspective is that Pat was a career prosecutor uh, who took the uh, ideals of the department to heart. He was running a prosecutor's office with several hundred prosecutors and responsible uh, for ensuring that the same standards were applied to hundreds of prosecutions uh, every year. Uh, and I had confidence that, that uh, he would bring those same standards to our case. Um, but that is not uh, the typical experience with any of the independent councils. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, uh, if you put me in the Rawlsian state of nature and asked on any given case representing any given public official, uh, would you rather have someone across the table who is a career prosecutor, or would you rather deal with an independent counsel in terms of, of, of having some confidence that the right result would be reached, uh, I would pick a career prosecutor 100 times out of 100. Um, but, but the other issue, and, and, and that goes to the issue of credibility, is that I don't think that we pay enough attention to the price that the system pays uh, for using the criminal justice system uh, to infuse uh, what is at least partially a political process with credibility. Uh, and, you know, I, I think back to when I was first, and, and let me say from the perspective of 2017, this sounds incredibly quaint, okay? Uh, but I was retained by Karl Rove, and uh, a lot of people that I knew stopped speaking to me, um, including my wife, who simply referred to him as Satan. And so, you know, <laughs> the, the phone would ring at home, she would pick up the phone, and she'd say, it's Satan for you. <laughs> and... <laughs> I, I got a call from a very good friend, also a lawyer, who said, you know, um, if, if uh, Fitzgerald doesn't prosecute Rove, um, how will we hold the Bush White House accountable? 
And, and my response was, well, you know, we have an institution for holding elected officials accountable, and they're called elections. And the criminal justice system uh, is designed uh, to, to address something entirely different, and that is whether there's enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to put somebody in jail. And, and, and there, there, there are two problems uh, in using the uh, independent councils uh, for, uh, to create political accountability and credibility. One is you set the bar incredibly low. Uh, you know, the, the, the question of whether or not, for example, Donald Trump is fit to be president is, is not going to be answered uh, by Bob Mueller. And, and the kinds of questions that he is asking are not the questions that we need to be asking and to outsource, uh, which is what we've done because of a failure of confidence in our political institutions, to outsource that task uh, to the criminal justice problem is, is a huge mistake. Uh, but the second issue is that I think we underestimate the price that, that is paid for doing that. Um, you know, as David Margolis always used to say, who was a, a a saint at the Department of Justice and, and someone every, all of us treat, you know, pretty much everything David always said as, as the gospel. And what he was always fond of saying was, if you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. And, and what I am concerned about is that in a system where there is a consistent attack on and lack of faith in our political institutions, uh, if you use the criminal justice process as a surrogate, uh, to essentially replenish the credibility that those institutions have lost, uh, pretty soon what you will find uh, is that the criminal justice process uh, is similarly infected with that level of doubt. And I don't think that we appreciate uh, both how precious and how fragile uh, the confidence that we have in the legitimacy of this process really is. And so when we think about whether and how to perhaps recreate an independent council structure, uh, we think only about the benefits in terms of credibility, but we need also to think about the cost. <clears throat> so maybe I'll start by saying, uh, people talk about democracy often and say it's not perfect, and there are a lot of issues with it, but it's the best system we have. I think there's a lot of um, issues with having a special council generally, um, but I don't know that there's a perfect solution. In the, uh, the Valerie Plame investigation, I think one thing I would just describe what was different about the structure, I was called a special counsel, but it wasn't an independent counsel. I was a sitting U.S. attorney in Chicago, so I had a lot of powers subject to DOJ approval. For that matter, I was given the powers of approval. I didn't have to go to DOJ for that, but I was subject to being fired by the great David Margolis. And um, he's a great guy, and if he had fired me, I'd still say he's a great guy, but you don't want to be fired by anyone. But the check for the system was if I did something that he didn't like, he couldn't change that decision, but he could fire me. Uh, if you look at a system, you could put the play in the joints where there was closer supervision or less supervision, and the closer the supervision, um, you have less of a concern that something goes out of the norms, but more of a risk that people perceive there to be political influence if it's coming from DOJ, and that's sort of the issue. What I would say is uh, when we had that approach, first of all, the person you put in charge of who has the the, the knife to cut the cord and say you're fired is someone you need to really trust, and that was David Margolis to a T. Um, the second thing is when you talk about a team, I was given a team because the investigation had been going for several months that came from the national security section since it involved a national security matter. So what I did was I blended in a team from the Chicago U.S. Attorney's Office because I was told I can get rid of the people that were doing it. I met with them. I was impressed, and I just thought, well, where do we add? But we apply the, the methods of a U.S. attorney's office, which is you would sit people in a room and say, what do we do? And you'd start in a room where some people are saying yes and some people are saying no when you went through that process. So I think, in essence, at the end of the day, uh, you have to come to some uneasy balance of how much discretion you're willing to delegate down, which is a lot in, in that case. And the thing I fear going forward, though, is I think people are in a situation that when there's a special counsel, whatever, whatever the structure is, People are acutely focused on what's happening, and people don't have patience to say, let's wait till the whole process is out in the open and decide what we do. Um, grand juries, by their nature, are secret. People don't like uh, reporting that we don't know what's going on today. Um, instead, they'll, they'll make guesstimates. Uh, one of the things I think confused people in the, in the Valley Plain matter was, by the, time I had, uh, by the time I was assigned the case, 
It had already been determined, largely, uh, who had spoken to reporters and mentioned her name. What wasn't known was what did the people who had those conversations understand? Did they know she was a covert classified officer or not? So it was a mental state case. It was what were they thinking, not a whodunit. But the press didn't know that for a long time. And it was almost as if there were times when you got the press reaction like, well, why didn't you interrupt the grand jury investigation and give us a little update so we weren't going down the wrong track? If you're in a situation where there's a grand jury investigation going on, you're going to have partial information. You will have people who are allowed to talk witnesses, so there'll be some partial information. I worry in, with the, the, the state of attention people pay today with, with blogs and Twitters and how much instantaneous information we have, that someone doing that job will have it a lot harder because people are trying to figure out day-to-day -day what's going on when the system, if you're treating people like Joe Sixpack, the system just says we talk at the end. And so I don't think there's a perfect system. I think we have to work through it. Um, but I do think we have to use the processes that have stood us well. And I think the closer to the traditional criminal process, the better. Uh, again, thanks, David, for organizing this panel. Um, I agree with Pat that there's no perfect system, but focusing back on David's original question, which is whether the current system works, uh, my answer is no, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, and, and when it does work, it works um, because we get lucky. I think we got lucky when Pat was appointed to do the Plame investigation. I think we're extraordinarily lucky that someone like Bob Mueller was appointed to do the uh, current Russia-related investigation. But remember how contingent it was that the special counsel uh, that ended up being Mueller was ever appointed. Uh, many, all of you probably remember the history, and it was quite contingent. Now, I was in the independent counsel's office under the statutory scheme, and I think one of us, maybe George, said that, that um, by and large, um, the appointments and selections were good. I beg to differ. I think it was a very mixed bag. I think there were some good selections. I think there were some extraordinarily bad selections. One, I have a list of the independent counsel investigations and their length that, like Phil, I did some research last night, looked them up on the only reliable source, Wikipedia. Uh, and, and if the SB investigation lasted seven years, the investigation that started with the investigation of false statements by Henry Cisneros, lasted 11 years and ended up focusing on high-level Justice Department officials. So much turns on who is selected. And even when you had uh, the three-judge panel making those selections, they missed as often, at least as often, uh, as they hit the, the target. So I think the current system um, is broken. I think all of the different systems that we've had uh, have been broken. I agree with Phil that in the past, under the independent counsel statute, the threshold was too low. I think now the threshold is too high, uh, and that we require too much of a public outcry in order to prompt the appointment of a special counsel, in part because it's been such a rare event uh, over the last 15 to 17 years. So what do we do in its place? Let me recycle. Uh, a proposal that I made to Phil Hyman in 1993 uh, when he recruited me to the Inspector General. And that is to have the Inspector General of the Department of Justice be responsible as kind of a special counsel in waiting for matters that are extraordinarily sensitive that involve the investigation and potential prosecution uh, of high-level public officials. Uh, the virtue of that is you have an existing institution embedded in the Department of Justice. You have somebody who has been nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate based, and I believe this is the only statute that requires it, based on considerations other than partisan affiliation. It's the in the Inspector General statute. They have to be appointed uh, without regard to partisan affiliation and based on their, on their expertise in certain areas. Now, the last three inspectors general of the Department of Justice have all been career prosecutors. Me, Glenn Fine, and currently uh, Michael Horowitz. So by thinking seriously about adapting a current institution to take on this additional responsibility from time to time, when it's necessary, when there is a sufficient 
factual predicate to launch such an investigation. You achieve many of the virtues of the standing institution of the Justice Department, but you lower the threshold to some extent and you make it more likely in appropriate cases uh, that an independent counsel type investigation would be launched. The other thing that I think is really important in high profile matters that end up calling for a special counsel, they reflect a huge public appetite to know what happened. The criminal justice system, because of the use of the grand jury, is really not well equipped to do that. But there is a model for doing that. One example of it is the Truth Commission in South Africa. But another model is, again, the Inspector General model, where the principal product is a detailed report describing exactly uh, what went on. I think one of the virtues of the independent counsel system was the requirement of a full-blown explanatory report that described what was found during the investigation so that the public's appetite for the entire underlying body of events uh, was put out there for public discussion and public exploration. Uh, people whose names were, were in the report and whose conduct was described could comment on it, uh, but the reports were released, and that's the same process that we followed uh, in the Inspector General's office. So to be pr provocative, and because I believe that's actually a better system than what we have now, I think we ought to seriously discuss the possibility of having an existing entity do it that could bring in more prosecutors on detail, more agents on detail for a major investigation, but where you have an existing institutional base that has a reputation, that has other responsibilities, so you minimize the chance that you're going to pour too many uh, resources into an independent counsel type investigation. I think it's an idea worth exploring and worth discussing. I too want to thank you, David, uh, for organizing this. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, just a few, few comments at the end of the line here. Um, the, the question is whether our institutions are well designed to deal with the situations of potential law breaking by high ranking executive branch people. I'm inclined to think that our experience um, tells us first that it's a very, very difficult problem. That's no insight. But second, uh, my view is that the best of the uh, possibilities that have been tried thus far is really to do what the Constitution assumes will be done, which is that the executive branch is responsible for the investigation and prosecution of crime, including crime within the executive branch. Now that presents an obvious conflict, and we've gone uh, th through great somersaults and difficulty and expense over the last decades dealing with that obvious conflict. It seems to me that the independent counsel system uh, was a colossal failure, um, and I think mostly because it, uh, it institutionalized an, a, a mentality in the prosecutors that they weren't really part of the executive branch and they weren't accountable as such. And that was a huge problem um, among others. Another problem was that they only had one thing to do. Uh, they had a defined investigation for, uh, to investigate uh, certain people uh, arising from certain circumstances. And once you've invested your time and your career and your name and you've hired a staff, et cetera, it's, it's hard to stop once you start. And there's often a lot of uh, smoke around such investigations, uh, and usually there are at least some sparks to create such smoke, so it's easy to continue. With the demise of the independent counsel statute, we've, we've returned to the prior approach of special counsels, and I think by and large that is a far better system. I do think it is a mistake to appoint somebody who is not already a sitting United States attorney. I think that um, the appointment of Pat was, was a great success in that respect. Uh, I've worked on these matters from uh, uh, sitting here. I thought initially it was from both sides, uh, from within this, the perspective of the in investigator or prosecutor and, um, and uh, also from the perspective of uh, a person whose job was to represent the White House. But it occurred to me that I've been on all three sides because I've also been investigated by a special counsel, uh, uh, which, which isn't fun. And, and the, the, uh, the best part, my highest recommendation is if you serve in the government at a high level, make sure your conscience is clear. 
because otherwise it would be very, very difficult to go through that sort of experience. The, uh, the experience in the Bush administration with investigations like the Plain one um, was very difficult. It was distracting, it was time consuming. But there, in, in, in the difficulties though were not about um, the substance of the investigation. I think and hope, and I would be quite surprised um, if he thought otherwise, that Pat was left free to do his job, free from political interference, certainly from the White House. Which isn't to say that we didn't interact with him in his office with some frequency about important matters, such as uh, what evidence can be introduced in open court involving national security. Now, that's, that's a matter that really is uh, for the president to, uh, to decide because there are collateral costs from, uh, from introducing such evidence. And, and there were you know, some difficult conversations around those kinds of problems. It was better that he was a sitting United States attorney in those conversations. Why? Because he had an institutional mentality um, that was different, I think, from what it would have been had it been his only job, his only focus to focus on this one prosecution of this one person. Other investigations involving uh, high-ranking people using special counsels, I think were successful in part because the U.S. attorney not only had the perspective of multiple investigations, experience as a prosecutor, managing a whole office, understanding what was and what wasn't um, worth the effort in terms of criminal investigation, but it was also important that that person was part of the Department of Justice, which reports through the Deputy Attorney General to the Attorney General, who in turn reports to the President. And in the end, these prosecutors have an enormous responsibility to, to make sure that crimes are investigated and prosecuted in the ordinary course, not in the extraordinary course. One factor I want to mention before finishing is this. I think that process works, that structure works, but it only works if, if in the culture at large, organically, the media does its job. The media is thirsty for information, and many of my co-panelists have talked about the, the tensions that arise because of the secrecy of the grand jury, and that certainly is a problem. But the, the taste for accountability in the media on behalf of the public is a highly constraining force both on prosecutors at a very high level of generality, not specific level of generality, and also on the political actors who are working every day to try to do the job of, uh, of running the country, representing the people and running the country. That, that means that the media has to hold everybody involved in these controversies accountable through their reporting and it also is important to mention, and this is the last point I'll make, that the media has to be prudent about that as well because uh, um, false alarms and uh, excessive and hyper um, sensational reporting only serve in the long term to dilute the true function of the media, which is to keep the people informed of what their government is doing. Investigation and prosecution of crime uh, is a centrally important uh, feature of the executive branch's mission. The people are entitled that that, that that is done professionally and fairly and consistently. The media's job is to see as best as it can to, um, whether that is happening and, and to say so or say not. But it's also simultaneously the job of the executive branch to do the rest of the work of the government. The independent counsel system experience showed um, uh, didn't work uh, it, it was overkill, and it was distracting to the, to the executive branch uh, in many instances and for obvious reasons. The, the system we have now, so long as the media does its job, I think is, is much preferable. Thank you. Um, let me just um, sort of frame a couple questions for further discussion on, among us, and then we'll, uh, then we'll open this for questions from the audience. So one, one thing is Mike Bromwich's proposal that the way these matters should be handled is by having a permanent office within the Department of Justice that will have among its responsibilities, although not its sole responsibility, to handle these kinds of investigations. And I think there's something approaching a consensus on the panel that one thing we, that one way we've gone astray is by detaching 
the special prosecutor or independent counsel, whatever you want to call them, from the Department of Justice. And as George said, prosecutors have enormous uh, power that is essentially unchecked by the other branches when they are, when they've convened a grand jury and they're um, calling witnesses, executing search warrants, threatening people with prosecution, bringing prosecutions. The judicial branch can't really check them at that point. Congress can't really check them at that point. Where do the checks come from? Well, they come internally from the uh, from within the executive branch. And I think there's something close to a agreement among us on among the panelists on on that. And the way Mike proposes to do things would institutionalize those checks. So I wanted to ask uh, the panelists if they wanted to respond to that. The other the other question that for me comes out of these discussions, and a couple of people said this fairly directly. Um, uh, Bob in particular, I think, uh, is, is are we using, trying to use the criminal justice system, and Bill as well, are we trying to use the criminal justice system to do something that really is not a matter for the criminal justice system? That what we really are trying to do is to, it, it's basically a, a very high level political, not a partisan political task, but a high level political task of determining the fitness of people for office. And the criminal justice system is ill-equipped to do that. And let me just focus on one thing, uh, and I, this is, I'm, I'm out of my league here as far as uh, knowledge of how of, uh, criminal prosecutions, but my impression is that at least in normal criminal prosecutions, there's a tradition, a kind of put up or shut up tradition, that either you indict the person or you don't. And if you don't indict the person, that's it. Um, special prosecutors, there is a different tradition, sometimes a requirement in law, that they uh, if they don't issue an indictment, they issue a report, which is, I believe, a deviation from the normal way of doing things, and relieves prosecutors of this obligation that, you know, either you leave the person completely alone or you enter the criminal justice system where they can defend themselves in court, um, rather than issuing a report against which there may be no effective defense. So I guess a two, sort of two-part question, the reaction to Mike's proposal that, you know, would it, would it solve a lot of these problems if we institutionalize this position within the Justice Department in, in, a, in a way that did not recreate the problems of having people with tunnel vision focus on one prosecution. And even if we did that, would it be inadequate because we really are trying to use the criminal justice process to do something that it's ill-equipped to do and we will create a different set of abuses. So anyone who wants to address that. Did you really bring this idea up three years yes. ago? Yes, <laughs> yes. I wrote you a terrific four-page memo articulating the rationale, and I believe your response was no. <clears throat> you may have already been gone by then. You've only been there for a few weeks. All right. Um, I don't, I'm, it couldn't have been a great memo because I think it's not, I don't think it's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now he tells me. <laughs> but the, uh, there are some troubles. One trouble is that uh, how, how many people with prosecutorial experience did you have in the IG's office, Michael? Well, I had very few. When I started of a 450-person staff, uh, it was me and my counselor. But then when we got investigations similar to what an independent counsel does, we started staffing up, and in fact, the first person I hired for the position was Glenn Fine. And by now, the office has, I think, roughly 15 to 17 lawyers, most of whom have prosecutorial experience. But what, what I supplemented that with was getting people detailed, including from Pat's former office, to help me on major investigations. And I think a similar system where you have a cohort of people who could do the work, but for a large investigation, or God forbid if you had multiple ones of these investigations at a time, you could expand it like an accordion by getting people detailed from U.S. Attorney's offices or Maine Justice. Uh, when the FBI wanted to take a look at, uh, when people wanted to take a look at whether the FBI had engaged in torture after 9-11 of people uh, who had been, who were strongly suspected of being terrorists. They did turn that over to Glenn Fine, and the IG did a very good investigation and came to the conclusion that, uh, no, in general, the FBI had behaved very well. 
So it's possible to commission such an investigation through an IG without having criminal law behind it. Now, let, let's talk for a minute about, well, why would you want criminal law? If you were going to end up with a criminal case, I might not be, I, I might not want the IG to put together the staffing for the prosecution. The IG doesn't have, uh, the IG doesn't have the power to require somebody to give testimony, does he? Not Michael? currently. He, he doesn't. Uh, the IG can't do searches. No, he can't do searches. But you keep telling me all the things that we use to find facts are not available to the IG, including the people we use to find facts. I mean, I, mean, I, I understand that it is, I, what I want is I want to get the truth out about whether the president covered up Watergate, about whether in any serious case the president was involved in something wrong. I am prepared at that point if, to leave it to the political arms, both the Congress and election, to deal with it, unless it was very serious, in which case maybe we have to think about prosecution. But the only way we have to really investigate thoroughly and carefully is through prosecution techniques now. We'd have, we would have to empower an inspector general with the power of grand juries and things like that. Right, that's the, that's the addition you'd have to make. I mean, the virtue of it, I think, is that by investing the inspector general with limited prosecutorial powers, uh, he or she would have the option to go criminally, or if they determined that it was not a prosecutable case, to still do an investigation and satisfy the important public appetite to find out what happened. That, and I think those are real advantages. Um, the, we, when we talked about, when uh, David asked about, are we doing it well, my colleagues brought up some of the options you could have a uh, Britain would have a judicial uh, would have a judicial commission, presumably headed by a judge, but with investigators and everybody on it, to determine what had happened. They had a big judicial commission to determine whether Prime Minister Blair uh, foolishly walked Britain right into the Iraq War because George Bush asked them to, instead of. Uh, carefully analyzing it. So one thing people do is they have judicial commissions. Israel has judicial commissions. Um, the other thing you have, the type of thing that uh, South Africa and other nations have done, which is truth commissions, generally intended to satisfy the victims of improper behavior by the executive in some way uh, by bringing out the truth about what happened. Uh, I worked on one in South Africa. It didn't look terribly, you know, it's five people receiving evidence from a certain number of investigators. It didn't look terribly reliable to me. Pretty, you could do it though, in other countries. Other people have done it. Um, I think you, that was a very good question you asked, and a very good, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, uh, all right, I'm going to step aside. So I might add this, I think there is definitely a, a space in which we want to have congressional or extra congressional commissions, you think about 9-11, after it, there's obviously a prosecution if you find people involved who didn't kill themselves, but separately from that you want as a country to say how did this happen, and did our agencies fail? There are definitely a lane in which you want to look at uh, if there's an allegation that any law enforcement agency is engaged routinely in some sort of practice that's not wise. We want to look at that. The Inspector General does that all the time. The hard part is going into something, finding out whether you're really looking at specific criminal conduct versus a policy. And obviously in the Watergate situation, if you're thinking about people breaking into buildings and stealing files or corruption obstruction, that seems like more of the criminal lane where you would put a you know, go down the prosecution lane. My concern would be if you get the inspector general prosecutor lane blurred, 
you want to make sure that people don't think you're going to take Watergate-type things and move them into some sort of um, report, uh, but not have a criminal option. I think people need to know that there's an array, a spectrum of what the outcomes are. And so one of the hard things to do at the beginning is to say, is this really a criminal investigation to decide whether or not someone should face the risk of jail? Or is this something about how are we doing as an agency? Uh, what are our policies and how do we change that? And it's hard to know all of that going in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question, David, and here's the conundrum. If the object is actually to get it right, uh, then I think the closer that you hew to the personnel, the processes, and the institutional norms of the Department of Justice, the more likely you are to get it right. Uh, but if the object is also to give the appearance of getting it right, the problem is the closer the connection to the, the department is an executive branch agency, uh, the less credibility it is likely to have among the public at large. And I think those are intention. But I, I, having said that, I do think that the four of you have actually made a terrific case here today of the importance of locating the special prosecutor function in the Department of Justice, whether it is a U.S. attorney who has that responsibility or refashioning the IG's office in some way, but the balance of not only independence, but the appearance of independence with a certain amount of rigor and uh, control over the procedures uh, so that the investigation is conducted as one of many, not one of one, that you, using the existing Justice Department mechanisms is probably the best balance. And I think you've all made that case very clearly. Just briefly, I, I think that the uh the professionalism and integrity and traditions and the daily work of the United States Attorney's offices around the country are indispensable in investigating and prosecuting crime. Uh, and using that structure um, is, I think, the only way sh to be confident that what's happening is uh, fair to the people involved on the merits of whatever the criminal problem is for the, the, the country at that point. It is a totally separate question what the public knowledge will be, what the accountability of the administration politically will be, et cetera. What we're talking about here is, is taking away people's liberty. That's a very serious thing, obviously, in this country, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious danger to people's individual interests to treat them differently in the criminal process because of the high profile nature of the circumstances. Uh, I, I, it, it seems to me that the, the benefits of the, the proposal to use the IG's office um, would, would not be uh, able to be, would not, would not be able to replicate the long tradition of, of, of how prosecutions have been conducted in this, in this country. And, and also, um, of course, the Department of Justice IG is only for the Department of Justice. The other departments have their own IGs. And I think what would happen inevitably is there would be hydraulic pressure for there to be a separate independent council functioning part of the Department of Justice. Um, and, and it strikes me that that would not be a good thing since we have a functioning way of prosecuting crimes in this country. Uh, and if people, uh, if the public um, has a taste for more information, more accountability, they can vote. Uh, the media can cause trouble. There can be congressional investigations. The, the criminal law is not the vehicle to get accountability for political disagreements. Um, I actually disagree with that uh, to a significant degree. I, I do think there is a, a strong, there's a compelling public interest in finding out what happened in matters that lead to a special counsel. And I think that we see today there is such a lack of trust um, in our institutions that uh, not taking into heavy account uh, the appetite and indeed the need for uh, what happened in a situation that rises to the level uh, of having a special counsel type investigation, we need to pay careful uh, attention to that. And I'm certainly willing to tweak my proposal. I agree with you that you want somebody uh, with a prosecutorial background. Uh, and again, the, fine, the last three Justice IGs have had that. You could change the qualification to require that it be a former U.S. attorney. Uh, 
who would bring to bear exactly the kind of standards and procedures. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that my proposal is a perfect solution by any means, and certainly there would be tweaks that would need to be made. But I think it's much better than the current system. Again, we got Pat Fitzgerald and we got Bob Mueller, but we were damn lucky uh, to get those two. And we could as easily have had a U.S. attorney uh, or a former FBI director uh, of far lesser stature and far diminished reputation and quality. And again, if you put somebody through the process like an inspector general nominee with the knowledge in advance that they may be called upon to do inspector general, uh, rather independent counsel type uh, investigations, that will be part of the confirmation process uh, to test whether that person who's been nominated for that position uh, would be worthy of the trust uh, that they would need to have in order to carry out those responsibilities. Just had two quick things. One thing I found odd when I was doing the job, when you talk to witnesses, they all, a, a remarkable number said, will there be a report? Um, because the old independent counsel statute had a report. And if you think about it, if you're going to a witness, presumably they may or may not know something. But they know something that's important. If a criminal charge would result, they could end up on the witness stand testifying that I saw this, I heard that, this person told me X. And I guess they get that, and they realize that's not going to change, and I guess they get that there's some possibility of a charge. Maybe they don't think a trial is likely. But all their lawyers are asking, is there going to be a report? And I would, I would explain that I wasn't appointed under that statute, so I don't think there's authority for such a report. But you always wonder, that was front of mind, and what would the answer, would any of their answers change? Would they be any less forthcoming? And I don't think anyone's going to sit there and say, if I know there's a report, I won't tell the truth. But part of the process of investigating is to get some level of trust with people to tell you things. And there are witnesses who can reach into their memory and say, I guess there's one thing you haven't asked about that maybe you want to know. So I think one factor in this is if you set up a situation where people expected there to be a report and what they have to say, whether or not you're going to chill candor. But, but am I wrong? Doesn't, don't the current special counsel regs require the special counsel to issue a report to the attorney general? And then it's the attorney general's decision whether to make it public. I think they do. I think, it, I think he does have to issue a report to the attorney general, but the attorney general doesn't have to make it public. Right, right. Okay. Just which way does it cut? Do you think if there's a report, they're going to be more candid or less candid? I, I think the risk is that if there's a report, they may be less forthcoming. I don't know how, how much that would mean, but I just think it's, if everyone kept asking, it was on their mind. Yeah. Okay.